already to Miss Marina. I'm so, I'm so happy that I'm staying local. I only live about 20 miles from here, which is great. We are right off 44, so this is one of the closest churches that we have. So I'm very happy that I'm here today. I've been Women's Ministry and Prayer Ministries Director for about a year and two or three months. Uh, so I lost already the new car smell. I lost that already. Now I'm been doing that for a little bit. It's, and one of the things that I would like you to know is that with prayer ministries, we have done a few things at the conference. And one of them that I would like to share, and everywhere I go, I'm, I'm starting to share that because I think that is important. When I was, I used to be a pharmaceutical rep, a medical rep for, for 17 years, uh, and I covered six states. So I used to travel a lot, and then they cut that to two states, and then one state, and then I had the state of, uh, the state of Florida. One year, I remember, when I start, first started many years ago, uh, I was in a, Baptist, in a Baptist hospital in Tennessee doing a presentation for endocrinology, because that's my specialty. It was uh, diabetes and, and all that back then. So I'm doing a, a presentation about diabetes, and there are some chimes that sound, but I didn't hear them because I'm in the middle of speaking, so I didn't hear anything. And the medical director said, uh, can, will you mind stopping right now? The chimes that you heard is because it's time to pray. So we stopped. They took prayer requests. They prayed. I was so impressed. I was like, this is a wonderful thing. So fast forward 20 years later, I'm now the prayer ministry director for the Florida Conference. And I presented that I would like to have prayer chimes at work. We are doing great things at the Florida Conference. We are the largest conference in the North American division. So I suggested, well actually I didn't ask for permission, I just asked the IT people if they could find chimes, little sounds that does not disturb, and at 9 o'clock, so we started this, it's been, uh, we have it in, in place for about a year now. So at 9 o'clock in the morning, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, at 5 p.m., and at 9 in the evening, chimes go off at the conference. And it's just a reminder that we need to stop and pray for the work we're doing for the Lord. So if you remember at 9, at 1, 5 and 9 p.m. to pray for the work that we're doing at the conference, spreading the gospel. You're joining us with this great thing that we're doing. So uh, I just wanted to let you know. Now for the women's ministry, we are 67,000 members at the conference. And did you know that 62% are women? So that's about 41,000 of us around. So aren't you happy? This is great. I'm just, I, I'm not making any point. I'm just saying that. I'm just left there simmer. You know, I think it's fun to say that. So we, we, we're, we're just doing great things. One of the things that we're doing that Patty mentioned is that we're doing this retreat. This is the first convention that we're doing that is only one. We, for the people that don't know, the month of February, the entire month, we go to Camp Colacua and we meet. So we do three or four retreats. This time we're doing only one, and it's going to be in a hotel at the Caribbean Royale. And we're expecting about 3,500 ladies to go. And I would love for the ladies here, not the men, you're not invited, but the ladies, uh, to come and join us. So if you can start making plans, talk to Patty, she can give you more information. So that way you can join us. It's going to be the first, the first weekend in January. So that way we can start strong and continue with our mission that is spread the gospel that Jesus is coming soon. Now I would like to start my part with a funny, funny story, if I could. Uh, and I'm thinking about the one about little Johnny. I don't know if you know it. Little Johnny, so it's a kindergarten teacher. And she's standing in front of her class and she wants to teach them about self-esteem. So she says, if anybody feels dumb, please stand up. Now, she's not expecting anyone to stand up because this class is pretty astute. So she's just standing there, and little Johnny stands up. And she's like, what is he doing standing? He's like my, my best student. 
why is he standing? So she goes over to him and she says, little Johnny, you don't feel dumb. She says, no teacher, but I feel so sorry that you're standing by yourself. <laughs> children, children, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that you have given us to be here today. And I ask you that you can bless me, bless my lips, that this message that I give can be in accordance to your will. I also ask that you prepare the hearts for the audience so that way they can understand and also start working in living the message today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I have a question for you this morning, and the question is, that I would like to pose to you is, you're going to answer this at the end of the sermon, I'm going to give you enough information so you can answer this, this question. The question is, is your light shining? That's the title of the message. Is your light shining? So I would like you to go back to 1 Peter 5, and if you want to open your book or turn on your phone for that Bible there. 1 Peter 5, and we're just going to read verse 7. Say amen when you find it, so I know that you are there. Okay. There, in, leave it open, it says, cast, what does it say? What is the word? Cast what? All. all. It says, cast all. Not some. Not the most troubling, not the most important, not the ones that God cannot do, but all of your what? Cares. Yes. On Him, because He cares for you. God cares for all of our worries, even the ones that appear so small and so insignificant to us that we're not going to allow God to work on that because He doesn't have any time for that. But he's asking us to cast all our worries to him. I would like to share a story about how God cares about everything and there's no small request for him. There is a rock climber and she is getting to the summit. And she is there tied up with her rope and going, you know, holding on to the rocks as she's going to the ladder of this mountain. And the rope hits her face and her contact lens falls off. She's still on the side of the cliff, and she can't see out of one eye. So she's looking with one eye to see if she can find her contact lens. This field trip is going to continue for the next two days, and now she only has one pair of contact lens, actually just one lens now, because she lost the other one. So she prays, and she says, God, you are the creator of the universe. Please, you know this mountain, you know every rock, you know what is under every leaf. Please help me find this contact lens. So she can't find it. She arrives, she gets up to the top now, she arrives at the bottom of the mountain, and a new group of rock climbers are getting ready to climb the mountain when one of them yells, did one of you lose a contact lens? And she says, yes, I did. Where did you find it? And he responds, Well, I saw this ant walking very slowly, carrying a contact lens. <laughs> so she told this story to her father, who is a cartoonist, and he created a cartoon of an ant carrying a contact lens, and the caption says, God, why am I carrying this thing? It's not food, and it's very heavy, but if you want me to carry, it, I'll do it for you. Isn't that great? And this is the God that we serve. It's a God that is so kind, and no matter how small or insignificant it is, He's listening to us, and He is willing to help us. Now, the question is, are we willing to do the same? This story comes from the newspaper in 2003, and it comes from Brazil. It was a Sunday afternoon, and there was a hit and run. A teenager was left on the side of the road bleeding. This taxi driver saw what happened and he tried to help. He couldn't, he realized that he couldn't, so he put him in the back of his cab and took him to the nearest roadside clinic. It was a quiet afternoon and there was no patient in the clinic. Sitting there was 
And talking was the doctor, the medical doctor, the RN, and the orderly. The taxi driver comes in screaming, there's a kid in the back of my cab. He's bleeding and he's going to die. Can you help me get him in? The medical doctor says, hold on one second. First of all, does he have medical insurance? This clinic cannot continue treating people without getting paid. The taxi driver says, well, I don't know. I just stopped and picked them up so he can be treated. And the doctor says, do you have any money? And he says, I only have about $10, but I know that that's not enough. So the doctor says, does the kid have any money? So he goes out there and he realizes that the teen is getting worse because the noises that he was making before when he was breathing, he's not making them anymore. So he comes back and he says, he doesn't have any money. Can you just come out and look at him? He's going to die. And the medical doctor says, no, because I will be liable. So the taxi driver says, then tell me what to do, and I'll do it. And the doctor says, no, because if you do it wrong, I'm still liable. So the driver got back to the cab, and he drove another half an hour to the closest public hospital. When he got there, and they came to get the teen out, the teenager was dead. The police came, and he did a report and the taxi driver was so upset saying that he tried to get this kid treated. He went to the roadside clinic and they refused to see him. So the police now had the task of, of informing the family of the horrible events that had happened earlier that day. So they got to the house and there was the mother and the little sister. The mom fell on the floor when she heard the news and she couldn't believe that her son could have been alive if he had only received medical treatment. But the story doesn't end there. Later that evening, the father arrived uh, to his beautiful home and he said hi to his daughter and wife that were just quietly sitting in the living room. He asked where his son was and the wife proceeded to tell him the events that took place earlier that afternoon. She told him how somebody had hit the son and left them injured in the side of the road and how a taxi driver stopped and took him to the roadside clinic. The father started remembering that many times he works at the clinic close by when they are short on doctors. And today, a taxi driver stopped with an injured son, with an injured teen. The mother continued telling the father that the doctor on duty refused to even look and then he remembered that he didn't want to go out to look at the team that was in the back of the cab. He suddenly realized that he had refused to treat, see, and see his own son, and save his own son. The article of the paper ends by saying that it has been a year since the doctor has been secluded in a mental institute out of work with a diagnosis of chronic depression and irreconcilable grief. Now I ask you, who is a Christian in this story? Is it the taxi driver? Is it the doctor? Is it the teenager? Would you believe that if I tell you that the three of them were from the same religion? I ask you to look in Matthew 2540. Let's look in 2540 to see what Jesus did, says there. Matthew 2540. Say amen when you find it. The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did to one of the least of these brothers, you did it for me. So how do we treat others? Is it a burden? Is it, does it take us out of schedule? Do we only treat people that are like us, or they look like us, or they do the things that we like? Jesus is the best example of how we treat others. And we can see this in two examples that I would like to share with you this morning. First, we find that in Mark 5, 1 through 20. And it's about the young man that was possessed. Now, in another part of the Bible, it talks about two demon-possessed young men. But I cannot handle two, so I'm just going to talk about one. 
So we're going to talk about this one. So if you are reading about this, it says that when Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee and he stepped on the ground, what was happening at that time? There was a young man that it was living where? In the cemetery, right? And they will tie him up. They will tie him up with, with shackles. Yes, with chains and shackles. And what would he do? He will break them. The Spirit of Prophecy says that this young man, his hair was full of mud and blood. And it was so matted that his eyes, and it was in front of his face. So imagine all this hair in front of his face that it was long. And he was naked. And he, his eyes were pierced through all the hair like two spotlights. And also, he was foaming out of his mouth. He will take rocks and he will cut his, his body trying to get this stuff out of him that he had. Now, what is really interesting is that when Jesus touched the ground, the Spirit of Prophecy says that all the voices in his head suddenly stopped for just a microsecond. That was enough time for this young man to realize that the person that was there was somebody different. So that's why he started running towards Jesus. Because he knew, wait a minute, he probably can help me. So he's running towards Jesus. And what happens? He suddenly falls. This is that the demons actually throw him into the ground. And Jesus asked something really interesting to this guy. Do you remember what he asked? What is your name? And what was it? What was the name that he gave? My name is Legion, which is about up to 2,000. So Legion just means the number. So it could have been up to 2,000 demons. Now, imagine that Jesus would have done like we do. Come on. 2,000? Not only one, but I understand one demon, but 2,000 young men, what happened? What, 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 what went wrong? You know, we got to go to church right now. we got to get you baptized. Is that what Jesus did? No. No. Jesus, what did he do? Before we ask, we answer that. Do you think, have you ever thought why Jesus asked, what is your name? I think, and this is me thinking, that Jesus was curious to see who was there. You know, there were millions of angels that were thrown, right? And there were Jesus' friends. Jesus knew all of them. And in my opinion, Jesus was just curious to know who was there, who was in that body. So now, the disciples come back because they have ran back to the boat. They come back because they think that Jesus is in trouble. And they find Jesus talking to a young man that is clothed. Remember, he was naked his clothes, and he's saying, who dressed him? There was no clothes there. So Jesus had to take one of his garments and dress this young man. He was still dirty. He was still full of blood. He was still with matted hair, but he had a sane and a cure mind. That is the Jesus that I serve. That is the Jesus that we serve. Now, I would like to share with you the second, the, the second example is the woman taken in adultery. That Mary Jane mentioned her in her, uh, what she was talking today. And you can find that story in John 8, 1 through 11. And they believe that this lady, her name was what? Mary Magdalene. That's what they believe, right? So she was caught in the act of adultery. Were there any rumors? Rumors about this? No. There was no doubt. She was in the act of adultery. Of course, this was something that they planned to, to catch Jesus. But this young lady had a reputation that most good women would not want to be close to her. She dressed like a prostitute and she spoke like one too. Have you ever thought how prostitutes dressed back then? We know how the cheap prostitute dresses now, right? Not escorts, you know, not the high paying one, because then, then, let me tell you a story about this. I was in Tanzania for something that I did for the United States government. And uh, so I'm there 
and we are checking in into this very fancy hotel and there is this girl that walked in with this man, it was a younger girl with this uh, older man and the guy that is checking me in, he says she's a prostitute and I looked at her and she is dressed better than I was. I was in jeans and a t-shirt and she was very nicely dressed and I said how do you know she's a prostitute? You know what I said? She's wearing pantyhose. Only prostitutes wear pantyhose. So since that day, I'm not wearing pantyhose anymore. Uh, because that's how they found out, that's how they knew that she would, but that's not here or there. I just, you know, had to say that. But how do you know that, how back then, in Jesus' time, how did you know that somebody was a prostitute? So I found out that they will, they will sew little tiny bells on the hem of their garment. So when they will walk, the bells were chime, and it was like the ice cream truck that would tell the clients that she was around, right? So that's how they would know. So, uh, so she dressed like a prostitute, and she probably used language that we do not approve. This could be our case today. We could have somebody doing that right now that is not doing the correct thing, or even our case, right, that we're not doing the right thing. And I always wonder, if we had a Mary Magdalene inside our church today, behaving like she did, how many of us would have shown her compassion and love like Jesus did? He did not condemn her. He said, go and what? And sin no more. And, I, I, and I, I always ask myself, how many of us would have told her maybe some words that would have made her cry? And maybe she didn't want to come to church anymore. And how many of us would have been ready with rocks to kill her and would have forgotten about her? But Jesus was there and he did not condemn her. Amen. Now I would like you to uh, join me in Matthew 5, 16. Matthew 5.16 And it says, you have it? In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So in the same way, let your light shine before men so they can see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So that is how God is, is he's rejoiced. We praise Him by the way that we behave. But you know, at times, our light is not able to shine because there are things obstructing the light in front of it. It could be the way that we're behaving, it could be the attitude that we may carry, or it could be that we're just caressing a sin that no one knows. I remember somebody told me, but I don't want to give it up. You know, this is the only thing that I have. This is what makes me, uh, you know, so love and, 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 and makes me not go insane. This is the only thing that I have. And I remember saying, but you love the sin more than you love Jesus. And it's separating you from the walk and it's distancing you from the walk that you have. But And then this person said, but I deserve it. I deserve it. So what do we have? You know, what is, what is our alternative? Are we holding on to something and not wanting to let go? And, and it's, that thing is not allowing us to get close to God? And because of that, we are not doing our best and we're not shining for Him? The sin, sin is very costly. And God sent His Son to pay for that price so that way we could have eternal life. Now my question is, is that sin obstructing my relationship with Jesus? And what could it be? Could it, it could be just something as simple as envy or lust. Maybe is it just gossiping, adultery. It could be racism or fornication. It could be cheating and profanity. It could be love money or maybe abusing other people. What is in my life that is not letting my light shine? Why is my Christian walk unstable? 
So we can find the answer to that in Isaiah 59.2. Isaiah 59.2. What is not allowing my Christian walk to be stable? And when you find the say, Amen. Isaiah 59.2. It says, but, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So our sins, our sins are the ones that have separated us from God. Our sins are the ones that are hidden his face from us so we cannot see him. So what do we do? So what is it that we have to do now? So three simple steps. First of all, we need to confess our sins. So what does that mean, confess? Confess means accept our guilt, accept responsibility, take responsibility to because of what we did. So that's the first step. What is our first step? Confess. Second step is repentance. Repentance and restitution. So this sounds like really big, and I'm talking to the little ones. This means just fix the problem. So in Matthew 5, 23 to 24, it tells us how to fix the problem. Can we go there? Matthew 5, 23 to 24. It tells us how we repent and how we do the restitution, which means fixing the problems. You have it? Matthew 5, 23 to, through 24. Amen. It says, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you. So it says that you have something against your brother? No, it says what? Your brother has something against you. So somebody did something to you, okay? So somebody did something to you. It says now, leave what? Your gift in front of the altar. So what it's telling you there is that you first have to go and reconcile with that person that did something to you, not that you did something to that person. So sometimes we're waiting for, well, I'm waiting for this person to say, I'm sorry. Well, this is not what the Bible is telling us. The Bible is telling us for you to go and say, I'm sorry to somebody who did wrong to you. Isn't that crazy? That's what the Bible is telling us. So we leave, leave, leave our gift there, we say, I'm sorry, and then we come back and we finish offering the gift to God. So we fix the situation, and then we go to the third step. We find that in Colossians 2, 6 through 7. Colossians 2, 6 through 7 is the third step, and it says that we need to hold on to Jesus, and we do not let him go. And that's what it says in Colossians 2, 6 through 7. It says, so then, just as you receive Christ, Jesus as Lord, Continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. So God is willing. First of all, we confess, we repent, and then we hold on to Jesus. Because God is willing to take us as we are. But we need to be willing to give up the sin, right? So sometimes we want to live with God, but we don't want to give up whatever it is that is holding us back. And he's not going to, Jesus is not going to force us. He's just going to accept us just as we are. And as we get to know Jesus and we walk closer to him, all those things, because we want to hopefully get closer and be like him, all those things will go away. So we just need to admit that we did something wrong, we give it to him, and then we hold on to Jesus. Because God is willing to forgive us, He's willing to clean us, He's willing to heal us, and then He's willing to adopt us.